Okay, let's go to our Sunday School lesson. Turn, if you will, please, to the book of Psalms, Psalm 143. Psalm 143, and we're going to read uh, verses 7 through 12. We looked at the first six verses last week, verses 7 through 12. Hear me speedily, O Lord, my spirit faileth. Hide not thy face from me lest I be like unto them that go down into the pit. Cause me to hear thy loving kindness in the morning, for in thee do I trust. Cause me to know the way wherein I should walk, for I lift up my soul unto thee. Deliver me, O Lord, from mine enemies, I flee unto thee to hide me. Teach me to do thy will, for thou art my God. Thy spirit is good. Lead me into the land of uprightness. Quicken me, O Lord, for thy name's sake. For thy righteousness' sake, bring my soul out of trouble. And of thy mercy, cut off mine enemies, and destroy all them that afflict my soul, for I am thy servant. In these last six verses, Psalm 143, the word soul is used uh, repeatedly in the Old Testament sense. Verse 6 said, My soul thirsteth after thee as a thirsty land. We talked about the Jew fleeing into the wilderness without any food or drink or any supplies, trying to escape the man of sin. Verse 8 says, I lift up my soul unto thee. And then verse 12 prays, Cut off mine enemies and destroy all them that afflict my soul. Um, just as in Psalm 142, back at verse 4, I looked on my right hand and beheld that there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. In the Old Testament, the soul meant a man's physical life as well as the soul. And they were stuck together, uh, making them nearly synonymous with one another. Look back, if you will, at Genesis chapter 19. Genesis chapter 19. Genesis 19 and verse 20. Here is Lot. Talking to God, behold now, this city is near to flee unto, and it is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. He wasn't worried about his soul. He was worried about his hide, his body, his flesh at that time. And uh, also go, if you will, to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18. Ezekiel, and chapter 18. Uh, let's begin there at verse 4. Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. But if a man... You know, the, the soul and the body are two separate things. It's the body that commits the soul, the, the sin carries out the sin. But the soul suffers the consequences for the actions of the body in the Old Testament. But if a man be just and do that which is lawful and right, and if not eaten upon the mountains, neither have lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, neither hath defiled his neighbor's wife, neither hath come near to a minstress woman, and if not oppressed any, but hath restored to the debtor his pledge, hath spoiled none by violence, hath given his bread to the hungry, and hath covered the naked with a garment. He that hath not given forth upon usury, neither hath taken any increase, that hath withdrawn his hand from iniquity, hath executed true judgment between man and man, hath walked in my statutes, and hath kept my judgments to deal truly. He is just. He shall surely live, saith the Lord God. All that is works. Excuse me just a moment. All of that is works. Also look down at verses 19 and 20. Yet you say, Why? Doth not the Son bear the iniquity of the Father? When the Son hath done that which is lawful and right, and hath kept all my statutes, and hath done them, he shall surely live. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The Son shall not bear the iniquity of the Father, neither shall the Father bear the iniquity of the Son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, 
and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Verse uh, 27. Again, when the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness that he hath committed, and doeth that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul alive. And in the Old Testament, the soul and the body were joined together. In the New Testament, we read about something we refer to as spiritual circumcision, Colossians chapter 2, about verses 10 and 11 through there. And um, it's a doctrinal statement, it's a doctrinal description of the condition of a, a sinner and the condition of a saint. A sinner is someone with a, a living body and a living soul, but a dead spirit. When a person trusts Jesus Christ, he now has a living spirit and a living soul and a living body that he's supposed to consider to be dead. That's the, the, the chain that takes place when someone goes from a, a non-believer to a believer. And like I say, it's all a doctrinal description uh, because you don't feel anything, you don't sense any uh, difference in you. But what it means is once this person is saved, the, the soul living inside the body is no longer stuck to the body. It's now loosed, although it still dwells within the body until the, until the time of death or the catching away of the saints. Uh, is no longer so so that the soul is no longer charged with the sins that may be committed by the flesh. You have to keep that distinction in mind. But uh, this closeness, this relationship in the Old Testament was so strong that it caused the Apostle Paul to liken a soul, the, the soul, to a wife who is made one flesh with her husband, who he likens to the body. And because she was joined to him there in Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 5, which we won't take the time to read. The comfort of the soul in this psalm is a prayer for physical help as well as spiritual help. So in the middle of what seems to be a spiritual prayer by any saint who needs spiritual relief, there's a prayer for help by someone under the persecution or the pursuit of the Antichrist in the tribulation. It's funny how that theme can be pulled out of this psalm, this which seems like a, a prayer, valid enough for any Christian or any believer in any age, and yet uh, it'd be specifically uh, intended for someone under the hand of the, tri under the Antichrist in the tribulation. Verse 7 in our text, I mean, excuse me, paying attention to myself, back to the Psalm. Verse 7 in our text, Hear me speedily, O Lord. My spirit faileth. Hide not thy face from me, lest I be like unto them that go down into the pit. The pit is a pit, as in P-I-T, pit. Go back to Psalm 7. Psalm 7. And uh, verse 11 says, God judgeth the righteous, and God is angry with the wicked every day. Uh, verse 14, Behold, he prevaileth with iniquity, and hath conceived mischief, and brought forth falsehood. He made a pit, and digged it, and is fallen into the ditch which he made. In chapter, or Psalm 9, Psalm 9, verse 15 the heathen are sunk down in the pit that they made. In the net which they hid is their own foot taken. Go forward, if you will, to the book of Isaiah, chapter 14. Isaiah and chapter 14. Start at verse 12, if you will. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like a most high. If that doesn't, if that doesn't describe not only Satan, but the actions and the whims of the Antichrist, Satan in human form. I don't know what else would. Verse 15, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, 
to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee, and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness, and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners? All the kings of the nations, even all of them, lie in glory, every one in his own house. But thou art cast out of the gra thy grave like an abominable branch, and as the raiment of those that are slain, thrust through with a sword, that go down to the stones of the pit, as a carcass trodden under feet. And uh, Revelation chapter 9, if you will, please. Revelation 9. Revelation 9, and um, let's start at verse 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth to have, have power. In the tribulation, a pit is opened. And creatures come out of that pit to afflict men. And if things come out, then things can go in. There's some interesting videos you can find. Uh, YouTube's not completely worthless and wasteland. A lot of interesting things on there. Uh, and there are uh, articles and videos about holes in the earth that are so deep, they have no idea how far down they go. They don't have, have any idea what caused the creation of those holes. They're, they're perfectly round, and they just go down as, as deep as deeper than anyone can ever measure. And um, so if things can come out of that pit, then things or people can be cast into that pit. But the, the pit uh, prepared for those not worshiping the Antichrist, uh, the Antichrist and the false prophet will be and the wicked shall be cast into it themselves. Look at verse 8 back in our text. Cause me to hear thy loving kindness in the morning, for in thee do I trust. Cause me to know the way wherein I should walk, for I lift up my soul unto thee. It says, Thy loving kindness in the morning. Go back, if you will, to Psalm 30. Psalm 30, and notice there, verse 5. For his anger endureth but a moment, in his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. And also Psalm 49. And uh, Psalm 49, verses... 13 and 14. This their way is their folly, yet their posterity approve their sayings. Selah. Like sheep they are laid in the grave, death shall feed on them, and the upright shall have dominion over them in the morning, and their beauty shall consume in the grave from their dwellings. And if you will go back to 2 Samuel chapter 23. Second Samuel twenty three. Notice there verses three and four. The God of Israel said, The rock of Israel spake to me, He that ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God, and he shall be as the light of the morning. When the sun riseth, even a morning without clouds, as the tender grass springing out of the earth by clear shining after the rain. Christ said in Matthew 13, verse 43, uh, Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Well, this verse is a prayer for the coming of the Messiah, for the reign and the rule of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, over the earth. And will be fulfilled in the coming of Jesus Christ. 
verse 9 of our text, Deliver me, O Lord, from mine enemies. I flee unto thee to hide me. That's self-explanatory enough. Verse 10 then says, Teach me to do thy will, for thou art my God. Thy spirit is good. Lead me into the land of uprightness. The land of uprightness. Well, that's not California. Uh, that's not Australia. That's not England. It's not uh, New Zealand or China or anywhere else in the world. That, um, that's not even New Jerusalem. Uh, the land of uprightness will have to be the land of Palestine or Israel during the millennial reign under Jesus Christ. Go forward, if you will, to the book of Isaiah, chapter 26. California is not the land of uprightness. Someone said California is a, a granola steak. It is. Whatever is not a fruit or a nut is a flake. I think that perfectly describes California. But Isaiah 26, and the first two verses there, In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Open ye the gates, that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. And verse 7. The way of the just is uprightness. Thou, most upright, dost weigh the path of the just. Verse 9. With my soul have I desired thee in the night. Yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. For when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. So this is clearly a uh, prayer for Jesus Christ to come. In the land of Judah, the land, or rather the land of Israel, will be the land of uprightness. Uh, and only because, only because the righteous one, Jesus Christ, is here at that time, executing judgment over the world and all the nations and the universe by extension. And it's, it's, it's more than a human mind can seem to process and wrap, it, wrap itself around that one man, one glorified man, Jesus Christ, God in human form, will be here upon the earth once again, ruling the world, ruling the nations of the world, and the rest of the universe by association along with it. That one person in history has that kind of authority, uh, greater than any king, greater than any emperor, any ruler who has ever existed, it will be the glory and the absolute power of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's hard to wrap your mind around that, but it's nevertheless what the Bible reveals to us. Verses 11 and 12, Quicken me, O Lord, for thy name's sake, for thy righteousness' sake bring my soul out of trouble. And of thy mercy, <laughs> cut off my enemies and destroy all them that afflict my soul, for I am thy servant. You, uh, as a New Testament regenerated, born again believer, have already been quickened by the Holy Spirit. For Ephesians 2 1, you had the quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. That means to take something that was dead and make it alive once again. Um, and so you and I have to apply these words to ourselves only devotionally. When you need God's help, when you need God's intervention, when you need God's assistance, uh, you have to apply texts like this only spiritually. Even today, although you are saved, or although both of us are saved, God doesn't cut off all of our enemies uh, or destroy someone who uh, afflicts our souls when we... The Bible says, in the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And um, you and I are told to brace ourselves and prepare ourselves, because as Christians, uh, the world is going to be hostile towards the, the, the Lord Jesus Christ and the preaching of Christ, and everything you profess to believe in as a follower of Jesus Christ. And it's getting worse all the time. There's no denying that. It seems like everywhere you turn, there's something that wants to pervert your mind or corrupt your thoughts or 
you watch something that seems harmless enough, and all of a sudden, some character in that television show or in that movie blurts out a bunch of uh, profanity. You think, why do they have to throw that in? It's the last thing in the world you want to hear. It's the last thing you want uh, in your mind. And um, you know, just when you think something might be helpful or informative, you, you watch it, and then someone does that. And you can't, it's, it's, seem to be impossible to escape from. you standing in line at the grocery store. You know, there's all those tabloids that are right by the register stand. And it's always about some celebrity who's uh, in a new affair with somebody else and nobody's ever married anymore. Marriage is the last thing on their mind. They just want to fornicate and have uh, illegitimate children and have the rest of the world approve of it and you know, accept it and applaud them and praise them. Uh, they're not being praised for for being moral and upstanding. They're being praised because they put out a good movie last year. Or, you know, that proves that uh, we can be debauched and wretched and be just as good as our favorite celebrities. It's just, it's amazing. But uh, the world's just getting worse all the time. Everywhere you turn, there's something that wants to offend your sensibilities as a believer, as a Christian. You can't keep your, your eyes pure, your ears pure, you can't keep your heart pure, because everywhere you go, there's either something you see or hear on the drive to work or on the drive to school, um, some thought comes into your mind, you're dwelling on that. I remember, uh, you know, you get some song, some song that you hadn't heard in 25 years. Just when you think, I've long forgotten about that, you'll be walking through Walmart and it comes through the PA system. Ugh. Now it's stuck in your head for the rest of the day. And you were hoping that thing was long gone. But uh, that's the way the, the way the flesh is. The flesh is weak. And only by daily um, surrendering, your, surrendering yourself to Christ once again uh, will you have any hope of victory that day. You can't have victory today based on yesterday's prayer. Every morning has to be started new with God. And... Uh, now, the, the skeptic, he wonders, why do Christians feel the need to talk about Jesus all the time and be praising Jesus all the time? Don't they have any will? And the truth is, no, I don't have any will. I can't trust myself, nor can you trust yourself. You know, when you're a skeptic, you're, you're a, a doubter, there's one subject that you cannot talk about. That is the subject of sin because it makes you guilty of sin. By, but by to use the word sin, it implies that there's some divine law of right and wrong that you have offended, that you have violated. And so to deny God means you have to deny the whole idea that men are sinners, that there's some divine law that they've broken, and they're going to have to give an account for it one day. So they have to deny the fact that there is any such concept of sin, or that they themselves are sinners. So rather than admit that they themselves are sinners and they're guilty of violating something higher than themselves, they just uh, criticize other people for their hypocrisy and you know find someone else to point the finger at, but it's never pointed at themselves. And then um, turn, if you will, to Revelation chapter 6, and I'm almost done for today. Revelation 6. We may finish a little bit earlier than usual, but I, I think that'll be okay. Revelation 6, and begin there at verse 9. When he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true? Dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also, and their brethren that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. So the servant in our text, verse 12, will have to be one of those. And the trouble, mentioned there in verse 11, for my righteousness' sake, bring my soul out of trouble. 
the trouble will have to be applied to the time of Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah 30, verse 7. And uh, as God says in Psalm 50, verse 15, Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. The day of trouble will be the time of Jacob's trouble, to the Jew most specifically, but to the rest of the world without Jesus Christ. And the new birth will not be available to them in the New Testament, in the tribulation, like it is to us now. Only the hope of surviving the tribulation and entering into the millennium with Christ by not taking the mark of the beast, seeking to help the Jew in his time of persecution, and uh, survive to the end. But the idea of being regenerated by the Holy Spirit and born again at that time, that's no longer offered. The time to get saved is now. This is the time that men should say, it's easier to trust the work of Jesus Christ on my behalf and trust that he died for my sake. He was punished by a holy God for the sins that I was one day going to commit. And uh, understanding that, I can say, I make the righteousness of Christ mine, cover my guilt with his goodness. And God forgives a sinner on that basis. He writes your name in heaven and grants you eternal life. And the Holy Spirit comes in and begins to live inside of you. Now, uh, unless someone has done that, they, it's hard to appreciate how powerful that is. But once you do, and you begin to enjoy being a new believer in Christ, you'll say, how could I have put it off so long up to now? But at, once the rapture takes place and Christians are gone, a whole different set of rules are then in place. It's a matter of faith and works coupled together. And it's been asked how much faith and how much works. I don't know. I'm not going to be here. So, <laughs> but, but, that, but that truth seemed to be undeniable. By the way, did you notice there Revelation uh, 6 that talks about the souls of them that were beheaded. It says to rest yet for a little season. It says white robes were given unto them and uh, which that coupled with other verses, which we won't go into today, gives a description of the soul. The soul has the shape of a body, although you can't see it. It's the shape of a body inside the physical body. It's able to wear a robe. It's able to speak. It's able to communicate. In the story of, of Lazarus and the rich man, both of them wake up in hell, Lazarus in torments, and see it. Uh, or Lazarus in comfort, rather, and the rich man in torments. And uh, the rich man says, Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. So the soul can sense pain. The soul can sense a drop of water to give it some small measure of relief. And the soul can wear a robe and in eternity. And so the idea that the soul is simply the mind or the consciousness is false. The soul has a bodily shape. It's just you and I can't see it with these eyes. But that's another study for another time. 